class. This is going to be all about um, thinking of how we can communicate and showcase tone and atmosphere in our writing. We're in a stage style channel on Discord, so that means you do have to raise your hand if you want to be heard or if you want to speak aloud. So you can click that hand raising icon to get invited to the stage. And then once you are on the stage, you have to click, or once you have been invited, you have to click this green button that says accept invitation in order to be uh, brought up. We are WordCamp, which is one of our many skill camp servers. We have our main one being Script Camp, which is focused on screenwriting, but there are many other servers besides this, including Film Camp for filmmaking, Code Camp for coding. You can see all the different options and different servers that we have here on this little menu. We have lots of free classes, table reads, script swaps, and writers groups that meet every week. We have about 100 hours of different events and classes per month, with new stuff being added all the time. We're a nonprofit that offers free and low-cost classes, workshops, and events for you to learn new skills and reach your life goals. Um, I won't go through my in own introduction now, uh, but I will just shout out all the different script swaps we have going on during the week. Tuesdays at 5, Fridays at 11 are the main ones, and we have Writer's Voice ri Live Readings of Prose, Saturday at 7 p.m., Thursdays 10 a.m. These are all in Pacific time, and you can come by those to hear reading, uh, to hear your peers read from their short stories, poems, nonfiction, and get feedback live. We have table reads for scripts three times a week, Sunday 2 p.m. and uh, Tuesday at noon and Saturday at 3 a.m. Pacific time, which is the, our international time slot. So not a lot of Americans probably going to that one, but that one is going to be 10 a.m. London and a little bit easier to attend in the, on the worldwide scale. So 3.30 Mumbai, 6 p.m. Australia, things like this. Um, we have a big list of all the classes and events here. This is not a comprehensive list. There's plenty more, so check the events tab on any of our different servers, and you can see all the stuff that's coming up. Discord Bot Developers Lab coming to Code Camp and Web Developer Boot Camp on Fridays. Novel Boot Camp starting in March, so late March in the next two weeks, we will be starting our new Novel Boot Camp. That is going to take you all the way from idea to finished draft of a complete novel in about 12 weeks, or 90, what is it, 90 days of writing. Is that 12 weeks? It's close, right? So in 90 days, you will go from, you know, just the very beginnings of an idea to having a complete first draft of a book. It may not be amazingly good, it may not be perfect, but it will be a book, which is always the point of these boot camps, to try to get you creating and making the next thing and moving on to the next thing and, and improving every time and getting feedback, but not getting too hung up on any one project. Advanced Fiction Lab Thursdays at noon, and that is something you can apply for, so it requires writing sample, but you can do that here on WordCamp. If you have not yet joined the Unlimited membership, you can access all the classes beyond just this free one and other free events like this. If you'd like to attend the boot camps all the way through, so the full 90 days for the novel, eight weeks for a feature, six weeks for a TV pilot, you can join that at scriptcamp.net. You can sign up on our main homepage by scrolling down to where it says Unlimited. You can see all the different things that you get here, but basically it's unlimited access to every class, event, and workshop on every server. And if you enroll yearly, you will save 40% off of that. Okay, so um, let's get into our main topic for today, which is, I mentioned before the class started, kind of an exploratory one. This is a bit out of my normal purview of things I've teach and topics I've done before in that we're really focusing on tone and atmosphere with an eye towards art. So we're gonna be looking at and analyzing some paintings today, asking questions like, what is the mood here? How would we convey this in words? So what we're really doing is, although we're not, a, writing is not inherently a visual medium, because what we're doing is just on the page, although we are reading it and looking at it on the page, you're reading it and processing information as its main way of sort of communicating its meaning and its narrative and its themes and everything else to you. So we have to kind of draw this interesting distinction in terms of writing in that we are um, we are creating pictures in people's minds, right? In prose writing especially, that doesn't include illustrations or anything like this. The goal is for you to uh, work with your reader so that we can help them imagine things as they, like, it's basically up to them how they imagine it. We can sort of help them to imagine the right things. Sometimes if you include less detail, then it leaves more room for the reader to sort of step in and imagine things on their own. Um, we can give more detail to sort of leave less room for imagination, but to help sharpen and clarify that mental picture. But we might often ask this question, where does, wh how do you, like, where do you draw the line between those? How much is just enough that the reader can imagine it on their own? 
And how much do you need to require for it to be the bare minimum for the reader to form the correct kind of mental picture of everything going on in the scene? Because if they can't quite picture the scene properly, they may not understand the action, it might be confusing, they may not understand just who is standing where or doing what, these just kind of basic things, which become really key to understanding like the action and flow of choreography in your book or things like this, especially if you're writing battle scenes or any other large, chaotic, confusing sequences. Um, it can be quite difficult to keep track of all of that unless you have used just sort of that Goldilocks zone of just the right amount of detail to say where people are in relation to whom and, you know, establish your scene geography, provide enough sort of details for the reader to be able to see in their mind what's going on. And then also sometimes, especially if you're writing in the more literary kind of mode, right, then sometimes among your goals in writing this book are to sort of do interesting different things with language or to, to add a particular art artistry to the way that you paint a scene, paint, so to speak, the scene, in such a way that we aren't really focused on in something like screenwriting, for instance, where you can't really use those extra words because we value the economy of language and the clarity and brevity of that writing over the sort of artistic expression of it. So the point of reading a screenplay is usually not, we're not reading screenplays for prose or for the artistic merit or the artfulness of that prose. If a screenplay happens to have great prose, that's usually just seen as, wow, like that's, a, that's an interesting added element to this that can make your voice kind of stand out off the page and things like that. But ultimately, it's not sort of the basic appeal of that because the screenplay is not the work of art. Legally, it's not even considered a work of art. That's why you can find so many scripts for free online that like, you know, nobody's really chasing anyone down for posting scripts for the most part. Occasionally, that happens obviously for scripts that are under wraps or things like that. But most people don't read these for enjoyment. Um, and it's considered a more utilitarian building block style document, as opposed to uh, prose writing, which is, you know, novels, or in some cases, nonfiction, journalism, things like this, um, in which we are using words in a different way, in which the words that you use and how you use them are a primary way of entertaining the audience. It's not really just saying, okay, imagine the story and the story you imagine will be entertaining. It's saying that the very words that you are reading will be sort of delicious to the eye, or they will be, you know, in whatever way, they will be kind of um, crisp and crunchy, perfect words. Like, it's, it kind of gets silly and abstract when you start breaking it down in those terms, like what is a crisp, crunchy word? Um, but we have to pick our words carefully because in a book, words are all you have. So we have to really kind of um, be tuning our word choice to the atmosphere and the type of tone, the type of mood and emotion that we are ultimately trying to create. So we have to learn to kind of evoke those emotions and construct vivid settings to improve our storytelling and descriptive skills because simply the scenes that are described better will be more evocative and memorable and stick in people's minds and like a well-described and well-written scene of something exciting and cool happening is just objectively better than a not well-described scene of something cool happening. So you might as well just write it to the best of your ability. You obviously are not going to want to tip over into the purple side of prose, which we will discuss that sort of spec. I don't really have an overview for the class, but I want to touch on the spectrum from minimalist to purple prose. And we will look at describing certain images using different levels of detail. I um, hope that sounds interesting and exciting for everybody. Maybe this is a, a little bit out of our normal sort of topics and how we approach these things, but um, uh, let's get into it. Uh, okay, let's uh, look at our first slide here. So I want to first talk about this idea of brush strokes. So you can paint a bird as a little squiggly M in the distance in the sky, or you can paint a bird using a hundred thousand brush strokes is a super detailed close-up of its eye reflecting the light on the ocean, right? Like, um, you can use any number, like you can use any number of brush strokes to paint anything, just as you can, well, maybe uh, maybe one might be kind of difficult, difficult to convey certain scenes. But in any case, like in, in ter let's just think in terms of sentences illustrating scenes, you can write one simple sentence that explains, that sums up almost anything going on. Or you can use a whole book to describe just one single moment, one crystallized moment in time that you just go into endless, endless, endless detail on. Um, it may not be an entertaining book, but the point is that you can use any number of words to describe pretty much anything happening. They Fought is just as valid as spent writing a whole book, writing, you know, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. <laughs> the good and the bad guys fought. Okay, that's one simple sentence to describe that. Or we can, you know, go into all the details and on the specific skirmishes and clashes and tipping of the balance in the war and the shattering of the arrows and the shields and everything else, right? So um, you can think of this idea, I like to think of it in terms of these brush strokes, and we can even, let's even look at a, a picture which I think kind of will 
touch on this idea. So let's look at this here. This is in the ward. Um, oil on wood pulp board from the Thompson Collection at Art Gallery of Ontario. And when you look at it from far away, or at first, it almost... And, and I don't have the artist's name, I just have the collection for this. I've included all the info I can on them. But this it's almost like a finger painting, right? Like It's almost like a kid's drawing that, they, that you do in school that they you know put up on the fridge at home or whatever. Obviously, there's a lot more into it than that. It's just we kind of imagine that, you know, the smudgy style, the smudgy minimalist style is something that we just see in kids' works a lot. But obviously, you can look at it through that very sharp artistic lens of an adult and do a lot more with it. So you can see that, for instance, the, the ground, you can count the individual brush strokes. You can count them. You see where one begins and one ends. The, the fence, you can see that each individual spoke of it, each plank has just been one little slash of the red paint, right? Um, and the ground, you can watch, you can see those little smudges swirling that make up the walkway and the steps. Each step is just one little smudge of paint, right? Um, so you don't need that many strokes to even paint a complicated, because like no one's in doubt of what we're looking at here, right? Or what the perspective is, or even what the kind of feeling we get from this is. There's a quality of light here. This feels like we've chosen these colors very carefully in such a way to, like you have, do you see like for instance the front of the building and the left side of the building which is in shadow? So we've chosen two different versions of that same color, the one on the right being the one that is lit by the sun, and the one on the left being the darkened version of it that is shadowed. That's like a much more advanced technique than you would see in like that kind of minimalist children's style. So I think that sometimes using less brushstrokes allows you to do interesting stuff. This is where my lack of art vocabulary is starting to show, isn't it? But the point is that let's compare it to, here's this, uh, another painting of houses and a street, right? How many brushstrokes were used on this one? Like 10 billion? <laughs> uh, thank you, Dakota. This artist from the last one was Lauren S. Harris. The artist for this one, um, which is uh, oil on canvas, is Lauren Mercer Smell. It's called Helena from the Alley from 2019. You can see them if you look really, 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 really close. You can see some smudges and things like this. And, and you know, just like the product of the, the, the brush on the board or on the canvas. Um, but there's no real way to count the brush strokes because it's nowhere near as minimalist as this one, right? So you can see how just houses on a street can be depicted in completely different levels of detail from fewer brush strokes to more to, you know, thousands of brushstrokes. But that doesn't mean that one is better than the other or that either of them is objectively, you know, um, more complicated or less complicated. Like, it doesn't mean that one of them is more work or less work necessarily. And it can take, for instance, you might imagine, like a hundred, painting a hundred minimalist paintings before you get to just the right sort of balance of strokes to detail and things like that. So um, I did want to just start off with that idea of brushstrokes to sort of tie into that w way that we also, as literary artists, who are creating these same sorts of scenes, but just in our readers' minds, are able to use different number of words, different complexity of words, different types of syllables, and things like this, to depict these scenes in, any in as much detail as the scene requires. Because some scenes are sort of benefiting from more description, atmosphere, and tone in these things, and some benefit from less. You might think, for instance, action scenes where we want to focus on what the characters are doing. And if it's set in areas that we already basically know what they look like and feel like, we don't need to overly describe things that the reader's already really familiar with. And if you're starting off a Tom Clancy you know, action thriller novel with a car chase happening on a street, it might drag the pace kind of down to go on to, to go on and on about you know the glinting auburn of the sunlight off the roofs of the cars and the way that the the you know the squealing tires create the smell of singed rubber on the road and like to go obviously you would include some of those details but to go on and on and on about it might drag down the pacing of you know city street a car drives by like at lightning speed something like that might kind of feel like it's happening quicker because it's simply the eye moves down that page faster and has less work to do and less to process so using more words on the page is almost akin to holding the camera on something longer because the amount of words in, is our cinematic lens, essentially, as it pertains to writing in the prose form. Um, the more words you use to describe something, you might imagine the camera lingering on something more and the, the reader being forced to spend longer with that thing. And with prose especially, we can't choose what we pay attention to. You can only read the words linearly unless you're writing some really crazy House of Leaves kind of like non-traditional literature where 
uh, there's, you know, different arrangements of words on the page. Normally, in what is called ergodic, straightforward Western literature, not just Western, but in uh, languages that we read left to right, front, top to bottom, then uh, we can't choose what we focus on the way you could with a stage play, or the way you sort of could on screen in that you can choose what you look at in the frame. With prose, you kind of are taking the viewer, so to speak, down a very particular path, and you're sort of telling them the details to notice in a particular order, right? Which means that it often sort of behooves you to start with the sort of main subject of what we're seeing before you start adding that extra detail, unless for some reason you want to obfuscate what we are seeing or perceiving in the scene, or you could always like do similar thing, similar to cinematic techniques on the pages, just the detail that you choose to include or omit, right? In the same way that when a character emerges from a car in a movie, you could just show their boot emerging from the car. Or when a character emerges from a car in a book, you can't do that though, right? Because we can't conceal their identity in the same way. But we could just describe him as the man with the heavy tread or the man with the, you know, the man with the rubber shoes. And then later we reveal who we were actually talking about there. So that's just uh, not exactly tied to our description of atmosphere and tone and landscapes and things like that. But that is just to speak to how we might sort of replicate the sort of cinematic ideas on the page, which when you're screenwriting, that's exactly what you are doing. Um, you are literally trying to give a sort of blueprint and instructions to a crew and a director and a cinematographer and all these people to create the images that you have in mind that will go on to sort of tell your story. When you are writing a book, you are all of those things. You are the director, you are the cinematographer, and you, um, although you, you, you can't really control exactly what people imagine, just because the way they imagine things specifically is up to them, we can give them sort of clues and um, we can write around the thing, like to sort of give the, like you can sometimes do things like give just a few small details to create the larger picture of something. If you might imagine we just describe, um, you want to describe a really run down neighborhood, you might simply describe one single broken window with bullet holes in it or something like that, right? Which might be in a manner similar to this technique that we call synecdoche in writing, where you describe just, or you use the name of something, the part of something to describe the whole of something. You can sort of do a version of that with description in just focusing on one part of something and then using that, those details to stand in for or to build out the mental picture of the rest of it or the sort of implied space that the reader will then be sort of providing on their own for themselves. Does that make sense? I'm realizing now this is a stage channel, so I... Uh, uh, no one's going to be weighing in, but um, at some point I do want to get volunteers. Um, I won't call for them now, but pretty soon we will ask for hands raised, and I will be posting in the chat a PDF, which again, I can't really exactly source. I can't remember where I found this. If you guys maybe in the handout it says at some point where it is. I think it's from a college or community college. Um, this is just like uh, questions and analysis and things that we will think about while looking at the artwork going to look at these questions like the elemental questions on page three such as uh what does this remind you of what are the connotations of this what does it make you think of what emotions do, this, do these colors evoke and why um just basic things like that there's you don't have to be an expert you don't have to actually have uh, any advanced education in this we're going to be asking questions like what do you see here and how does it make you feel and why okay um, so, I want to just talk a little bit about the spectrum of um, minimalist to purple a little bit more and show some examples of what is purple prose. And we're going to try to describe, and you don't have to make it exactly perfect, but we're going to try to pick like which details would we focus on? How would we build out a description of this scene? And we're going to think about it in terms of in one sentence, in two sentences, and in three, in that sort of minimalist, purple prose, and right in the middle. Which, which is not to say that sometimes the one or the three won't be the, the right, the thing that you go with or like the style that fits your, the way that you write a little bit more. But that is to say that just by thinking of the same description in three different levels of detail or three different scales of detail, we can sort of cut out everything that we don't need and keep the stuff that works. So um, let's look at, I wrote this uh, just stupid description of the spoon uh, just to talk about what, I'm, what I mean by purple prose, right? Bathed in the soft luminescence of the kitchen fluorescence, a solitary spoon lay on the wooden expanse of a table, an unassuming harmager of the coming breakfast. My reflection warped in its mercury surface, a circus clown in the tarnished silver mirror of a forgotten funhouse. The smudged sheen of its iron told epic tales of the flavors it once savored now lost in the endless soup of time. <laughs> it's pretty stupid, right? Um, it's actually kind of funny if you had a, maybe like one character that was sort of like this. 
But an entire book that was written like this would be maybe a bit much. And, like, to go into tortured levels of detail on small or otherwise, like, mundane details can be seen as purple. I don't really know why the color purple is the one that's chosen here. But, um, in any case, purple means that you have used too many words, concepts, ideas, comparisons, too complicated words, and, um, like, too, too many of them in order to describe something. Um, yeah, Luke says, imagine how this person might describe something important. Exactly. So you don't, might want to save the reverence. Like, <laughs> I, I remember there was this, uh, I forget who, which stand-up comedian said this, but there was this joke I heard once that was something like, you know, somebody describing, these chips are awesome. It's like, are they... Are they awesome? What are you going to say when you say when you see the face of God? <laughs> like, because you just used awesome for chips. So now where do we go? Like, that, that's a good question. What would this person who describes a spoon this way, how would they describe a war? Or the meeting of a deity? Or the emergence of a, a, an ancient spirit? Or something like that, right? So it might be kind of difficult to infuse the entire book with this level of detail because it doesn't leave you many notes to play. If you're always playing at a 10, then it kind of, I'm like, you know, I'm talking in terms of music now, so we're sort of connecting this to all different types of art, but if you're always banging the notes, the absolute loudest and playing the most intense part, like the whole song can't be the finale, but just be, like the whole story can't be the climax, and the whole of a book can't be, uh, you know, incredibly dense, detailed descriptions. Um, sometimes you have to move a little bit quicker through a scene or set or get to the point faster or find the character in it and hone in on things that people care about, which are going to be in a narrative things like character intention obstacle tactic like those basic dramatic tools that will hook a reader like this will help you this is like the cinematography this the prose you use in a book is the equivalent of cinematography in that it sort of beautifies the experience of that story and it makes it more pleasant to sit through and to read to read and to watch and um it's a large part of what distinguishes distinguishes one author from the next right like your voice on the page is a really key aspect of how you brand yourself, first of all, and second of all, just the types of readers that you will attract and cater to. So you have to like pick your words carefully and decide the sort of tone you're going for. You can always just write whatever you want and see what, I actually do recommend this. I recommend for a while, you don't really have to think too much about, well, how many words should I use? Just write whatever feels good to you. Whatever kind of comes naturally to you and whatever matches the st tone and style of stuff that you read most often. Um, you should be reading all the time and seeing the many different styles of prose out there, and you can always use that to kind of act as a yardstick to measure how you're doing in comparison to that. Like, I'm going to be writing, like, fast-paced military thrillers, um, but you have to kind of know if you're going to be trying to fit the mold of exactly what those normally look like, or if you're trying to change it somehow. Maybe you say, I write fast-paced mil military thr thrillers, but with a kind of literary approach. Like, that would be kind of cool to see, even. You, you just have to know that you're doing it. And you have to know that the readers would be like, wait, what is going on here? A little bit as they read, you know, your long descriptions of the shell casings glinting in the Auburn Twilight or whatever it is. So, um, you, whatever, you, whatever choice you want to make is valid, you sort of just have to end up making a choice. Even if you just want to experiment at first to find out what the best choice to make would be. Any ideas, questions, or thoughts on this idea of purple prose? Or any examples of it you guys have seen before there's some pretty funny some english teachers or whatever like some nerds like that i'll run this contest i forget what it's called but they sort of hold up the best examples of purple prose from there i think it's from their students work every given year or maybe it's a contest where people just write it on their own but there's like a couple contests where people try to write the most intentionally purple thing possible <coughs> luke mentions lots of examples from the victorian era yeah exactly <laughs> you might imagine that um in Great Gatsby sometimes brought us as an, as an example of Victor, Victor Hugo, Dickens, Bleak House. Yep. Some of these very masterful writers that are now seen as, you know, these are classics today. At the time, and even by some people now, are they're considered, you know, the styles are more florid than is common nowadays. You might think that, you know, in a time where people didn't really have TV, then this was the main form of escapism and entertainment, so you can sort of see why. And you can also sort of see that some mediums really kind of benefit from purple prose. Romy actually says, is it bad that I love purple prose? No, <clears throat> because it, purple doesn't mean, like it has a negative connotation, definitely. It is usually intended as a pejorative term to say, you've made a mistake here.
But if you lean into it and you write purple prose very well, then it can be good. I mean, if you read something like Gormenghast by Marvin Peake, I would say the prose is straight up purple a lot of the time, but it's kind of amazing. And you can sort of do that if that is just like <coughs> your specialty or the thing that you bring to this. I think that some other mediums, I am branch, I am, <coughs> oh, sorry, sort of distracting from the topic a little bit, but I, I will also say another medium that I think really does benefit from purple prose is uh, role-playing game writing, like Dungeons and Dragons game modules and game mastering, and the kind of, well, it's intended to be a, a form of oral storytelling, right? So you're not, the players aren't usually reading the descriptions that the game master or the dungeon master is giving to the, to the players. You're speaking it aloud to them, and as you do that, you can sort of add your own details and, like, make it your own a little more. But that kind of oral storytelling tradition, uh, in my view, does benefit from a more purple style because it's a little bit more immersive to feel like the game master isn't just making it up as they go along and like there is, it helps like provide that really clear portrait into the other world kind of thing that you're trying to accomplish. Um, and also it just fits the traditions and styles of this form of writing, which is very rooted in things like Tolkien and, you know, 70s and 80s high fantasy, which has a lot of purple prose in it. So I think D&D &D especially just, like, is kind of a lot of fun in, it, with, to use purple prose in. So I don't mean to say that purple is always bad, but you should understand that it has that negative connotation to it and is often discussed in that negative lens, or through that negative lens. Dakota mentions a neo-Dickensian style. Yeah. S. Craig Zoller, um, in his novel, um, God, what is it called? Hug Chicken Penny, uses this sort of interesting, almost like Dickensian homage style, but he does it really well. And S. Craig Zoller is another author that people often accuse of having very purple prose. And he does, but I love it, and it's perfect. So there you go. <laughs> <clears throat> um, I think Nacho linked something here. Let's bring that up. Is this, a, uh, is this from an existing book, or is, was this written as a joke? Let's see. I want to make sure before I <laughs> respond to this. I, Amanda McKittrick wrote, and uh, I think it's one of the most purple things I've ever read. <laughs> Great. Let's take a look. And sorry, I, my headphone was not working for the first part. Did you say this was from a book? Yeah, it's from a book called um, Irene Idlesley by Amanda McKittrick Ross. Got it. Got it. Okay. So a novel. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, let's bring it up. And it's public domain. Public domain, okay. Gosh dang, I've already seen some, some real heavy words in here. Okay, let's take a look. The December sun had hidden its dull rays behind the huge rocks that rose monstrously high west of Dunfern Mansion. Not so bad so far, doesn't feel purple to me yet, seems pretty good. And ceased to gladden the superb apartment jo Sir John occupied most part of the day. Okay, now we're... <laughs> ceased to gladden the superb apartment. They had withdrawn their faint reflection, they meaning the sun's rays, had withdrawn their faint reflection from the mirrored walls of the solitary chamber to brighten other homes with their never-dying sheen. As the dull gray evening advanced to such a degree as to render a look of brightness imperative to the surroundings of its sole occupant. Wow, that was tortured. Sir John requested that his favorite apartment should be made bright as possible by adding more fuel to the smoldering ashes within the glistening bars which guarded their remains. <laughs> this is... Okay, never mind. I changed my mind. I love this. This being done, three huge lamps were lighted and placed at respectable distances from each other. When Sir John, with his accustomed grace, began to peruse some of the evening papers... Though a man of forty summers, he had yet, never yet entertained the thought of yielding up his bacheloric ideas to supplace them with others, which eventually should coincide with those of a different sex. In fact, he never bestowed a thought on changing his habits and manner of living, nor until fully realizing his position of birthright that it had been treasured by his ancestors for such a lengthened period, and which sooner or later must pass into strangers' hands, did the thought ever occur to him of entering into the League of the Blessed. What? That last sentence was such a... I think he's talking idea. about the reason why he's didn't, you know, doesn't have a girlfriend. Is that the League of the Blessed? People with partners? Is that what he, the people? Yeah, getting partners? married. Because oh, okay. he said he's his, he he hasn't entertained the thought of yielding up his bacheloric ideas. Right, right, right. He had never. God, let's try to even decipher what that means. So he never bestowed a thought on changing his habits. Okay, so he never cleaned up his. He never thought about cleaning up his act. 
nor until fully realizing his position of birthright. I'm not quite sure what that means here. The context might, or the character might. Maybe up, becoming, uh, getting his inheritance or something? Yeah, it could be that. That had been treasured by his ancestors for such, such a lengthened period, and which sooner, so like, I've already forgotten the subject, which sooner or later must pass into strangers' hands did the thought of ever occurring to him of, occur to him of entering into the League of the Blessed. Wow. So I would agree, Nacho. This is... The first couple sentences were working pretty much fine, but the more that this went on, we're using really, really complicated constructions to express very simple things. Um, especially when we start... You, the more words you start... Enter, uh, in, these are almost like filler words, right? Um, gray evening advanced to such a degree as to render. It's like all those words didn't give us anything besides getting us to the next adjective, right? Or noun. Um, so the more, like architecture you need to put in between the main points of your sentences, the more tortured and laborious it's going to start to feel. Um, thank you for sharing this. Anybody else have uh, examples of interesting prose that they would like to share, or examples of stuff like this you've seen before? Or any questions about this? Let's compare that to minimalist prose on the other side. This is always, we're always going to back to McCarthy on this because McCarthy is considered sort of the king of minimalist prose. And this is a book that does sort of the opposite, which takes huge concepts. And although there are sequences where he does sort of go into his mm, classic McCarthy, really, really, really detailed and dense uh, diction, or not diction, but, um, uh, you know, word choice and um, concepts and things like this. Sometimes also it will be a sentence about somebody reckoning with all of human creation or whatever, and it will be as simple as, well, he unscrewed a can of beans. Let's look at the uh, description here. He screwed down the plastic cap and wiped the bottle off of the rag and hefted it in his hand. Oil for the lamp to light the long gray dusks, the long gray dawns. It's kind of perfect sometimes to use less brush strokes as opposed to more. You can see how one is not better. You can use very few very well, or you can use few very poorly, just as you can use a lot of them very well. That's a cool um, sort of like pattern in the last sentence. Yeah. Light the long gray dusks, the long gray dawns. Nice sort of um, almost poetry to it. And kind of just, you know, hinting at like that's their life, you know, like just, you know, all these long gray, you know, days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the world is colorless. Hiding, hiding from cannibals lifeless yeah exactly okay so that's what we're talking about the spectrum from this to this and let's do it with um some art uh let's get some volunteers who wants to look at some paintings <coughs> dakota i am all about this <laughs> awesome <laughs> I'm so glad. This is our first class like this we've done, really, so I'm out of my element a little bit, but I'm trying my best. Uh, do you have a background in art? Yes. Uh, I took as many art history classes as humanly possible. I literally have a print of the Magpie on the Gallows by Peter Borger the Elder, which was painted in 1568. Wow, cool. Literally on my wall. <laughs> awesome. Okay, great. Maybe you can give us a little more perspective. You might know a little more than me, then. I will definitely see the floor when it comes to fine art. I don't have a back. I didn't really study this. I don't have a background in this. I am simply a writer of books and movies and things like this, which, you know, um, I think we benefit a lot from learning the techniques that go into. Ultimately, this is what we're doing is creating pictures either way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I'll let you you can pick one of these ones that we already showed. If you want, these are two uh, just house suburb or suburban scenes. Um, I'll give you one more mm -hmm. option as well. So you can pick one of these three. I'll pick uh, I'll pick the narrows. Yeah, I'll Great. do this one. All right, it's by Jeff Bourgeau, I think. I'm not sure the medium mm -hmm. of this is the only thing. I think it is physical. Um, it's, maybe you can weigh in and say what medium you think it is, but in any case, maybe we'll just give it, let's take like 30 seconds and not say anything and just look at it.
now that we've all had some time to look at the painting, I realize normally you're supposed to spend longer. I think in an art museum or something like that, you would spend longer looking at it than, than just this. But to make sure that we get to all our volunteers and are able to go through the slideshow, let's just wrap up in the next few seconds. All right, Dakota, um, what do you see? What do you like? What do you notice? What do you feel? What, do you, what are your first thoughts? So my first thoughts is that this is a very claustrophobic painting. We're starting out very wide, but the leading lines suggest that we're going toward a narrow path, hence the title. Um, the composition is um, slightly off. It's not perfectly center. We're not exactly going um, immediately in the middle here. We're going slightly off to the right, um, which suggests that we are going, we're not really supposed to go um, in this direction, but it's the only direction that we can go in. Um, the dark forests that flank the left and the right, um, there is something peaceful, but there's also something ominous because you have different forests um, here. Um, one is more, more pine, the other is more um, vidigerous. So they're, they're painted in different styles. So there's definitely a different kind of, of, um, of world being uh, set out here. Uh, there is a journey of the unknown as we go narrow, but we see the big clouds. So we're like, is it an expanse? Is it a waterfall? We don't know. Um, so it invokes a very similar kind of feeling as to what you would find in paintings of the Renaissance period, where you had um, the young martyr, for example, um, which is a painting that is very dark. Um, this is a very light colored painting, but I'm not feeling happy with this. I'm feeling very like close knit and unease with this. Interesting. Um, what do you think? So that you mentioned the the colors a little bit here. What's the color? What do the colors kind of make you feel like? Is there, is there maybe like a season or a temperature you can feel with this? Sure. Um, I feel like this is late summer, early fall, um, just based on the use of orange and yellows. Um, you know, I can imagine, you know, this might be leaves or it could be, you know, dead grass or something like that. Mm. Um, since these are pines, they're most likely evergreen, so they're never going to have anything that's falling. Um, but there is, you know, that kind of tinge of orange there. Um, it's definitely in the evening time uh, based on the color of the clouds, because if you look at clouds and where the sun is, they would, you know, be that color if the sun is really low in mm. the horizon um, so it's either evening or opposite early morning um, it's one of those two and so you, is it, I like that you also mentioned this sort of the I think the, the title of the painting does give us a little bit of a clue here as to the focus or the focal point of this we could we could almost say the subject because in a landscape right. there, there isn't necessarily like <clears throat> we, we might imagine it there to be if you're painting a person the subject is obvious right but mm -hmm. in a landscape it's sort of like you might pick a focal point or something that is like the, so we have the narrows themselves in this kind of pass or this kind of path this uh the emergence from where this river widens out and then opens up again right that sort of horizon line that little uh spot in the distance there to me that sort of does seem like the the focus like if this was a painting of something it's a painting of that mm -hmm. i don't know if that is off the mark for how people talk about um, subjects and paintings, but to me, I think that when we're describing a scene, we often we have to start somewhere, right? Because we can't do we can't do right. this thing of just showing the whole thing all at once. We're writing linearly. So where would you sort of start when you were describing this scene? I would start from the fore. I would start uh, foreground and then move inward, um, because that's what our eyes are doing. Mm -hmm. um, so I would start with the very wide and then narrow, pun intended, in. <laughs> sure. Um, so you start with the water. So, yes, absolutely. Start with the water. Start with the, like, where the banks are in relation to this. Um, you know, we're veering to the right um, because that's the, the right bank is closer to the left. Mm -hmm. 
so yeah i would definitely start with what is most closest to the eye um and because i'm imagining that i'm in a canoe or a right. kayak and i've been in a canoe and a kayak and i've been in a very very similar situation to this so i know what this feels like mm -hmm. <laughs> so we might if you if you yourself are the subject that also helps us start with the with the describing the scene yes. as well because you might you think well where is the character and if the character right. is on the water in the boat, then you might describe them like approaching this scene by saying, you know, I, I approached uh, a narrow bottleneck between two opposing riverbanks, right? Right. And how would we continue to build from there? Let's, so if we just had one sentence, we would say I something like, I'm just gonna throw out there, you know, I paddled through the cool still water towards a narrow bottleneck flanked by two sharp black uh, I guess you would say they're like rocky cliff faces. Well, I guess they're more cliff faces than riverbanks, aren't they? Yeah, by two, uh, let's say, rocky outcroppings or something like that. And mm -hmm. then if we were to continue to expand, so now you've placed the character in the scene, we have this point of focus and where we're starting. If we're on the boat in the water, we now know where the character is and which direction they're heading and things like that. What would you describe next? I would describe, um, is there any kind of are there birds chirping? Mm -hmm. Is there something going on that is around? Um, is there nothing? Um, is there the stillness of the paddle going, just cutting through the water? Um, you know, it could be something very uh, serene like that. Um, so I would, I would pick something along those lines, something involving sound. Great, yeah, so sound, and we can, obviously, if you have a character, you've placed a character in the scene, so we can use everything, every all of their senses to describe the place as well, including right. the feel, the atmosphere, the, the temperature, the crisp bite of the air, or, like, the warmth of it. You have sound, or you mentioned lack thereof, so what, whatever, the, whatever sound you would be hearing if you were in the scene as well. Are there any other things that we would want to, what about our purple prose? How could we go even, even further? Oh, boy. Or pros. <laughs> so I would. So the sky is is this kind of orangey, like the clouds are kind of orangey. So, you know, I would. One of my favorite words is um, is vermilion, even though that's closer to a burnt orange reddish. Um, it's I, I I love it. <laughs> it's a great word because that's what that means. It reverts to the color of the thing. Mm -hmm. um, so you could reference uh, the great mass that is the clouds because they're, these clouds are huge. Mm -hmm. They are massively huge, and they're all one color. So that means two things. One, a storm is coming, or two, <laughs> or two, a storm is moving away. So there's something ominous going on with those clouds because those are very specific kind of clouds um, sure. so yeah. i would i would go in that direction too like what's coming oh yeah that could work great especially you know you start describing the swollen clouds that are heavy with rain and things like this mm -hmm. as they you know the distant crackles of lightning and thunder high above purple prose loves reflections as well so we've got a lot to do there i mean yeah. we'd love to describe like the the mottled ripples in the surface as they reflect the burnt umber of the sky above and the looming bowers of these trees which you know glint vermilion in the fading twilight and all that kind of stuff like right. that <laughs> right it, for sure not, not always the best descriptions but, but sometimes if you the, just keep adding stuff and i'll give you a little trick that i i've never actually really found this uh, i've never used this on my own but i've just heard people find this to be useful in describing a scene um and uh, it, it's easier with simpler scenes that have less going on, but just describe everything you see and like all every single detail. So imagine it's just like a, a, like a, a bed with a cat on it or something like that. Describe all the stuff you see, all the obvious stuff, and then list five more details, and then list five more, and then after that, list 10 more. And you're like, you're gonna have gone so far past just the obvious stuff that and, and into the ridiculous purple area that it might actually get you to certain observations that you wouldn't have made otherwise because it's going to require you to look past just like, okay, there's a cat lying on a bed. What do I describe? It's whiskers? Okay, I did that. Do I describe the dust that's on the floor that I can see? Uh, do I, like, you, oh, I already did that. So it makes you, it like forces you to sort of find those 
really specific and subtle observations that maybe only you would make. Does that make sense? Right, absolutely. Something that I thought of was, um, just because this is a nature scene, specific birds. So let's right. say, for example, there's a peregrine falcon. So how would you describe a peregrine falcon? Well, talk about the feathers. Talk about something, even, even if it's not actually in the painting. It does add a something there, um, and I love that. <laughs> um, the nice thing about – go ahead, sorry. There's a book called Peregrine, and it's literally about this guy, and it's just this guy describing the movements of a peregrine falcon, and it's like 300 pages long, and it's nothing but purple crits, and wow. it's wonderfully – <laughs> he must really like birds if he's gonna go through all that i mean uh right clearly he wants the world to to like them as much as he does um that's exactly. cool exactly and uh and also the nice thing that you touched on here a little bit is that when you're writing a book we are, the advantage that we have over the visual medium is that we're not limited to just this one frame you can talk about like we were, we're in a 360 degree scene that is sort of all around the characters. We can talk about if if you, especially if you're on, uh, writing an omniscient voice, um, which not that many books are written in, but some are. Um, it gives you the ability to world build through just you know. You mentioned the types of the tree, like old older books. We were talking about Victorian books, especially. They almost read like travel manuals or like um, nature books sometimes when the characters get to some new area, especially when it came to like exotic locations and things like that. People were just really interested in reading a lot about. The different species of trees that grow in this place or all the quirks of whaling if you're herman melville or you know all the just the, the really granular detail about the names for things the architecture the landscapes all that kind of stuff i think in a in a pre-tv world that was the main form of escapism so you can see why we gravitated towards that that's what victor hugo did in notre dame he literally described the cathedral so well that they uh, modeled the facade in the building after his description that's so cool. I love when stuff like that happens. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Anything else you'd like to sh say about this painting? Uh, other than that, it was most likely painted with oil or pastels, one of the two. Got it. Thank you. Um, thanks for analyzing. Oh, thank you. I do this all the time. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Dakota. I think I saw Megan raise a hand. Go ahead, Megan. I have some different paintings for you to choose from. I I was just um I, I'm quite happy to do a new painting. I just kind of wrote a line about the last painting. Oh sure, you want to share? Um, I I popped it into the chat. Great. Do you want to read it out? Uh, melancholy leached into my soul. The end of the golden summer was the end of childhood. Still glass the still glass waters of Lake Donner reflected the rugged rugged landscape and my mood. Nice. This is a good way of sort of connecting the character's mental state to the geog or to the scene that they're in. Um, so let's uh, let's pick a new painting. Um, I'll give you two choices. So we just we're doing a lot of the paintings without people in them. We're mostly doing scenes, and you can imagine a character in the scene if you want to. Um, oh wait, that one, why, why I just said <laughs> a painting with people in it. Um, so I do have uh, this Rockwell of uh, summertime, nice summertime drive, and then mm -hmm. I have this. Uh, kind of spooky, mysterious, perhaps comforting, mm, s snowy nighttime scene. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which one do you want? I want the drive. The drive, okay. So let's, uh, yeah. let's start just by taking a look. This is, and I don't have the year or the uh, medium for this one, I just have the artist, but I just, I, I assumed that it'd be easy to find which specific Rockwell this was, but then I Googled it and just in the time I had, I did not find the name of it. But in any case, I think it is for a magazine or an advertisement. But regardless of that, let's all just take a minute to look.
All right, first impressions? Um, the dog and the guy are having more fun than the woman. <laughs> yeah, she looks um, a little nervous, huh? That, yeah, she looks nervous. She's hanging on to him. He's definitely going faster than he ought to be. The dog is digging the whole thing. Definitely. Um, I get the feeling he's trying to impress her in order to get her to sort of have a, a little bit of a fright. You know, like, like, look how cool and fast and awesome I am. The dog is just enjoying itself. Mm -hmm. And I think that it, it probably has a small commentary going on in its, in its mind like this is like the third broad he's had out in the car this week out in the country. <laughs> Very possible. Um, yeah, I, you get the sense of, of movement. Um, not so much, you know, I, I think that he kind of, um, in a way, lost uh, an opportunity to do something with, with more of the, the people's hair. But you can still see that the dog is uh, is definitely got that um, you know we're moving kind of quality to it. Um, yeah. The way that the the car itself has been, um, you know, made less distinct on the outside as though it's passing by. It has blurred almost a little bit. Yeah, to to give it a sense of of movement and speed, which is which is quite nice. Um, this is actually quite loose for Norman Rockwell. Did you say loose? Yeah. For Norman Rockwell, this is actually quite loose and, and fluffy. Like, his stuff tends to be super friggin' tightly detailed. Oh, so you so, mean loose and, and... Can you maybe explain just... I'm, I'm a newbie with the art stuff. Maybe you oh, can expand oh, on that the, idea. The, the brushwork, the brushwork is, is, is not quite so, so tightened down so that every little detail is visible. Normally, when you look at a Norman Rockwell... Mm -hmm. um, it, they're very, very precise. You know, every every texture on a, a tree is normally articulated. So, so here he's 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 um, one. He's sort of having fun with it, uh, and two, he's he's also showing that sense of speed by using the sort of faster um, and and looser brush strokes. Just like we do but in scenes, that's right? Not really, but that's not really. I mean, in terms of like literary expression, that's not really. Um, necessarily relevant just how it makes you feel i think in a way and and, and, and right mm -hmm. like like brush strokes unless you're literally describing a painting and not a scene then the right, brush strokes are irrelevant but the way he's used them conveys that sense of light and fluffiness and and just sort of it, it, there's definitely a sense of joy um to his work it has a um a sort of summer or or late spring kind of feel based on the the color of the sky and the clouds and the, you know, it's, 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 um, it looks like they're, they're on their way somewhere, maybe a picnic. Mm -hmm. And, and, it, and, 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 and the thing I like about it is it, it leads you to speculate what they're thinking, you know, why is Bill driving like an ass, you know, and, <laughs> you know whatever, you know, um, you know, sort of, it makes you want to get into the heads of the characters and, and, and speculate as to what it is they're thinking about in addition to sort of, giving you the feeling of, you know, they're they're out of the city, they're into the fresh air. Um and maybe that's maybe that's a big thing, you know, the the ability to, to drive out to the country, to get away from um the responsibilities of work. Yeah. Maybe if we could boil it down to one word that describes the primary emotion of the piece, would you say maybe something like carefree, sort of? I mean obviously she Yeah, is, I would have said joy, but, but carefree also works. Um, weekend. A weekend, yeah. So that kind of uh, weekend makes you. How does a weekend make you feel? I guess would be the question, right? Free. Free, yeah. Free, worry-free, casual, letting loose, cutting loose. Um, yeah. How would we? Could we evoke different emotions from this in a different color scheme? Imagine like the same scene, but what if we wanted it to portray a more sinister vibe? How would you kind of consider it? painting it differently oh ominous storm clouds you're going to get rained on mm -hmm. um you know you can you could you, that what sort of like what might be uh, either mountains or a placid ocean sort of thing in the background could easily be you know a raging sea mm -hmm. um, so darker normally darker colors i think we normally do interpret as sort of yeah always indicates more usually sinister. yeah mm -hmm. whereas bright and colorful usually means more happy, joyful, carefree, and things like this. 
Mm -hmm. um, and what if we wanted I mean, to give it go. also um, which colors are are are, are you know sort of jewel toned colors and bright colors are often um, put in children's things. I mean they've, they've changed that recently. I don't know why, but because they respond to those colors. So it's 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 the type of colors that that harken back to childhood, right? right? The bright red, the bright yellows. Um, bright colors green. just kind of make us happy, I guess, in a way, right? Like, yeah. we, we associate yeah. them with happiness because to some degree they do sort of, I guess, if they make children happy, that proves that they sort of make us happy mm -hmm. as, as a whole. Um, what if we wanted to give this a somber or sad or reflective mood? Um, I would, if it was if it was me, tone down the colors, gray the colors down. Mm -hmm. um, take, make, take the light and, and make it less bright. Right, so you don't necessarily need to create a sense of ominous. You don't have to go as far as you know storm, but overcast gives a moody feeling. Right. Um, you know, maybe drizzle, kind of, not necessarily an impending danger, but just a you know an overcast kind of gray afternoon. Probably less um, speed, maybe less speed. Like if there was less, less speed, hurry, yeah. less urgency. Yeah. Like it, um, also, if you if you want to you know if you want the thing if you want a feeling of of, of that then the physical position of the characters right they right could be dog staring head out down to see. right dog head down ears down you know um, woman not actually touching the man but maybe leaning away from him Definitely. right that gives them more oh and I say this and it starts pouring like friggin' crazy outside my house. Oh, that, that's a fun coincidence. That's there's a really strange timing there. Um, raining a little here in LA too this morning. Um, oh, okay, just probably, probably came up. It worked its way up the, the state so. anyway. Yeah. yeah, let's uh let's think in terms of our minimalist to purple prose descriptions of this. Let's go back to the world of describing and novels and you know prose and all these things. Maybe you can just, it doesn't have to be perfect, but how would you just give kind of a one sentence to sum up what's happening in the scene? Um, one sentence? Yeah. Dear Lord, Bill, do you always have to drive so quickly? <laughs> well, that would be the dialogue that the characters are saying, but what if we're watching? Yes. We're trying to Oh, evoke, one of the yeah. thing. All right, let me try again. Um, let me think. Hmm. Yeah, I just get that. That's gonna be. That's gonna take me a moment. Sorry. Yeah, no, you don't um, have to. You don't have to make a good one. It, it, we are just trying to. I guess the purpose of the exercise is to sort of think. How would we sum up what we're seeing here? So let's start with what's the subject. So are we gonna say the subject is a family? Is the subject the car? Is the subject the guy? Who do you want to focus on? I mean, yeah, it's it's. I'm um, I'm trying to think of a way to to put it in a, in a in a in a way that doesn't sound um, corny. Just give me a moment. Okay, um, it's all right if it's corny. Yeah. Every weekend they drove to the country for a picnic, and every weekend Bill drove too quickly. Okay. So this is sort of giving a little backstory, a little uh, context. Okay, thanks for that. So we're just describing the trip that happens. So in yeah. your, your one sentence version is just saying, some people take a trip with a car, or um, summing up just the, the overall picture of what's going on here. Let's add a little more mm -hmm. detail. So maybe let's think if in two sentences, and again, don't, don't worry about as much about the backstory, but just as much as the visuals of what we're looking at right here we're trying to paint and evoke this specific scene um but how would we how would you add a little more what would you describe next the red car raced through the countryside the wind blowing through their hair great the, the speed and the motion yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah awesome let's get purple with it add even more go too far The Oxblood Red Racer coasted along the country, along, <clears throat> yeah, um, sped along the pastoral lane, dislodging insects in its path, 
and frightening small animals. Its inhabitants, a woman modestly dressed, a man of working class origin, and a sheep dog who'd never seen a sheep. All three were inextricably linked in their plans for a picnic. That was almost kind of lovely. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Megan. Um, the uh, especially I think when we go into Purple Prose Two, we sort of lose that sense of speed and momentum because sometimes the author will hyper focus on like I mentioned the reflections or where light comes up, light qualities of light come up in Purple Prose all the time. They'll spend so long describing like the glint of the you know the rust colored light off of the car, um, the uh, you know the we have birds in the sky we have the the cloud cover overhead we have the trees and the insects and the pastoral scenes also often get way into purple prose with like you know talking about the chirp of the crickets and the cicadas molting their shells in the grass and like we can just go on and on and on about every single little natural process that's going around the characters too anything else you want to share uh any other thoughts on this one no but thank you for uh for having me uh, on stage for a bit it was fun sure thanks megan so let's go to, I will, um, we will do more of these. I'll choose another volunteer, but I just want to bring up some of these questions that I was looking at from this handout and things that we can think about. So we're starting with just looking at it and thinking, what are our overall first impressions and what does it just kind of make you feel to begin with? And then we are asking things like, what color scheme is used? What kind of impact would this artwork have if it were in a different color scheme? What emotions do these colors evoke? Is there high or low contrast? Is the overall scheme warm, cool, a mixture or why that has actually come up a lot i want to go into this question also where does your eye go first and then next and what draws it there so we're going to talk about things that sort of draw the eye because that does sort of tell us usually it gives us a clue as to what we would describe first because the the thing that your eye is immediately drawn to in a scene is often what we want to start with because that um, helps ground the reader in okay you're looking at blank you're looking at a carnival scene now let's go into the detail on one of the clowns whereas we if we just start on one clown we may not have the full picture of what we're supposed to be imagining altogether. We might not have the atmosphere of the moment if we start on just a description of a guy. Whereas if we start with, you know, the description of the carnival, even a quick one that helps us frame everything that we will read after that in that lens. And with the, with the kind of knowledge of the sounds, sights, and smells that that scene would have. So it's helpful to set the scene first by giving us the overall picture. What is the first sort of thing that your eye goes to? And then we might ask, um, do any lines, edges, colors, or shapes create a continuous path for the eye to follow, which is sort of also what we're doing. You might imagine where does the eye go in terms of, well, what details would be most relevant to describe next? If we start with the circus, then we narrow our focus to the clown, we might start on the most, notice most noticeable or attention-grabbing aspect of that clown, right? Which might be the first thing you saw when you, saw, when you think about Sparky the Clown was his big red nose because that might just be sort of the most obvious or apparent thing about that. Um, okay, let's uh, get another volunteer and we're, we'll draw off some more from these questions. I think I saw Luke was the next to raise his hands. Hi, Luke. Hello. You want to choose a new painting? We have, um, I'll give you, it's kind of The Last Houses by Albert Burkle. 1922 kind of spooky streets I, I do like scene. that one what are my other options um i showed this one already so i'll leave that as an option i'll give okay. you one more i don't have the only thing is though with this one i didn't get the artist or the medium for it so i feel bad but i know for a fact it is i chose intentionally for this to focus on human art just because all the discussion about ai art recently i wanted to really highlight right. human art for a bit so Let's unfortunately with, uh, i can't credit it but go ahead the last houses Last houses. Okay, is this big enough? Or I can make it a little bigger. I think. I want to definitely see the top and bottom of it, so you have the full scope of it. But I just want to make sure it's clear. Okay, let's uh, let's examine.
Okay, first impressions, Luke? Uh, first impressions? Are oh, it's cool. I like it. It's intriguing. It's dark, mysterious, whatever. It's all the things I like. And, I don't know, angular, vertical. I like that as well. Um, my eye is immediately drawn to, like, the figure, I guess, instantly. That's the first thing you uh, want to pay attention to. It's like, okay, there's a figure with their back turned. Mm -hmm. Then the maybe the street light. Uh, my eye was instantly sort of pulled up to the the sky, I guess, like the weird clouds and like the the just harsh, I don't know, angles of the skyline. Um, and then I was sort of like drawn down by these stairs to look at like all these like shadows interplaying in the windows of these uh, last houses, I guess, sort of the subject matter um, of the the whole painting. And then I was drawn back to the figure, and I noticed. There's like a black shadow in front of her. She's holding uh, a child that's completely in shadow. That's so, how I interpret that too. That's exactly uh, what I what I thought that was. I wonder if everyone interpreted that the same way, but that's what I thought. Yeah, I guess it doesn't necessarily have to be a child, but it. Um, your my brain wants to make it a child. Yeah, definitely. The, the the pose would make sense, and the the way that she's holding it would would it it does seem that is the case. Yeah. That's uh, that's pretty grim, pretty grisly, pretty dark. Just a, a woman in an alleyway with a child that's all mysteriously uh, enshrouded in black because of the way the the street light is facing. Yeah. So this is what would you say is the overall mood or tone here? Uh, the overall mood, or probably grim, I guess would be the word. Something like does feel kind of yeah bleak. That? cold grim cold some people say yeah yeah i wonder why it feels that way what do you think it is i mean it could be this is a perfectly happy little neighborhood right well i mean blue is often just the artist's shorthand association for sadness mm -hmm. uh, so people's brain like like to go there when they see blue um and there is just something sad about the setting it's just a lonely street at night in a glum urban setting yeah feels kind of run down feels kind of uh, quiet and lifeless I guess you might say there's no life here yeah. besides the one figure who would I guess if this if we are to just declare a, a subject a focal point that this is our character right so we would probably right. in describing the scene start with her at least this is how we usually do you don't have to start with her but you could um, and we don't see her face either, right? So that also leads to a kind of coldness. The kind of character facing away or deliberately turned away from the camera always has that that layer of distance and separation. Plus the title is doing some heavy lifting. Uh, the Last Houses. Yeah, that's... You know, your brain can make all kinds of connections. Uh, yeah, I wonder what it means. based on that. Like... You know, the last houses at the end of the road, you know, the last houses uh, in chronologically, like in time, mm -hmm. you know, just different implications for the title. Right. Let's go back to our list of questions um, and let's ask a question. Let's let me check this here. So um, we've answered the question, is it warm, cool or a mixture? This is very cool for the most part, right? Is there any warmth at all? Yeah, the, the street light has that little glow of warmth to it yeah it's a little brown and amber kind of like earth tone um with the street light in the foreground so it has a mix of warm and cold i would say yeah and i guess the tones on the fence are kind of warm as well mm -hmm. and so we um in in describing this picture let's think just can you give us the sort of overall view of what's going on here in about a sentence Sure. Um, uh, in a quiet uh, neighborhood, you know, an empty street, you know, there's a single street light, and a, a woman uh, huddles something to her chest. Uh, in the shadow, we see the silhouette of a child. I don't know why I switched to screenwriting mode. Yeah. But... <laughs> um, that's okay. But so, oh, sorry, were, were you finished? That was it. 
that was it. Great. So you started with the light then, um, in that case, which kind of gives the impression of like if we were in screenwriting world, then we have a shot of the street on its own by itself, and then the woman sort of walks into frame. Or you could sure. also do it where you just start with her, right? Which would sort of be like we just cut to her directly without. I probably want to go start ahead. with the houses themselves if I was writing this as a scene. That seems sure. like the like the woman is being compared to these houses somehow. Uh, like that's that's the real subject matter of the the image is the houses. Sure. If you were going to do that and frame the houses as the subject, we might say something like you know the angular. Uh, working class homes towered over the l solitary figure carrying yeah. the crying child or something like that right yeah over a solitary figure you know carrying something probably through through an empty street and then maybe zoom in closer on what she's actually carrying sure yeah maybe so let's expand into your second sentence what would be the next layer of detail to add um i guess that thing about the silhouette of the you know in, in the silhouette of the street light you know we see the well, hold on. Are we doing screenwriting mode or uh, prose? Prose. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, and hold on. Whose scene is this? It's her scene. So we're doing like close. Are we doing close third? Up to know. you. Doesn't really matter. You um, can however you want. Yeah, I'd probably start sort of omniscient distance. I've described the houses, and then we, yeah, we've described the figure, and then the next layer would be. Um, the the bundle by her chest you know, the bundle moves basically i would animate it somehow and then i would start describing details that tell us that it's a child oh you know, okay through, so this is a sort of cinematic perspective though right because if it uh, were in her pov at all she would just be like my kid twitched in my arms or yeah whatever or or be the, sort of distant ahead. third i guess or so maybe from the pov of an observer that could work yeah this does feel like somebody's just silently observing the whole scene it does have a kind of almost voyeuristic feel to it to the extent that like the woman doesn't feel like she's a part she doesn't know this picture is being taken she's not like posing for this right i think so so uh in that case i'd have to sort of give the the narrator a little bit of a a voice and how he feels about the neighborhood or whatever there would be sure. lots of decisions i'd have to make that's true uh, Let's uh let's just make some then in terms of purple All prose. Right. Let's even if I give you a character, would that make it easy for you? I'll just I, you know, I'll give him like a Jack the Ripper personality. I think oh, everyone can sure. understand that. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's make it purple prose then. Add even more detail till it's ridiculous. Um. Sorry, I gotta clear my throat. Uh, her. The. You know, filth clung to her linens like the rats clung to the gutters of the cobblestones you know, <laughs> Rorschach? Like, is that you? Uh, uh, <laughs> is that how Rorschach speaks? Basically, in his journal <laughs> uh, well, He just he focuses on like he, well he kind of does, yeah, he focuses on like you've read or seen Watchmen, I assume, right? I've seen it, yeah You've seen it. Okay. and I've read parts of the the first Watchmen comic Oh, okay, but yeah, that's sort of what his description sounds because he kind of has a disdain for the city, like the filth and corruption of it. So his dis okay. descriptions are always like dripping with that kind of like, uh, like malice and like uh, okay, the, yeah. the griminess. Go well, ahead. I imagine a Jack the Ripper character would have like a malice for the the filth of the streets or whatever. Sure. Uh, so yeah, the rats. Uh, what else would he notice? Like. Uh, the the weather worn wood withered uh like the I don't know. Uh so we, oh, I've gotta describe like the contempt for the, the scene, right? So the woman uh, um, She dared to trundle through my she, alley like a you know, so you could always frame it like how dare she enter my turf or whatever. That's a good way to frame it, yeah. She, um... Uh, like, like, describing the smell or whatever. Oh, it's just turning it to perfect. Man, I don't want to write from this perspective anymore, honestly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Why don't we pick but, the perspective of a sort of, uh, a rich guy who's come to a run-down part of town. Okay. Um, sort of a, uh, a Charles Dickens type, okay. Yeah. Uh, so... 
Um, I saw her in the the warmth of the street light, you know, uh, uh, a suckling, you know, uh, huddled at her breast, you know, and I I felt a, a chill, you know, through my uh, my Scrooge-like heart. I don't know what <laughs> word you would say. Uh, and uh, and uh, you know, uh, I don't know. What, I'm just adding layers to the woman rather than the the buildings and the scene itself, which would yeah. You might say uh, something like, you know, if we're focusing on the scene, you could always go the direction of, you know, she trudged courageously through the the shadow of that looming you know citadel which it, to her it's like no that's where i live but to him it's like a creepy unsettling gross bad abandoned house right uh, the c- strewn citadel of uh sourness uh, <laughs> citadel of sourness yeah. that sounds like where uh, what's his name <laughs> lemon grab would live <laughs> <laughs> she, but i realized but as she as she trundled by the the oaken fence i realized she was not as af- she was not afraid of this place. She knew its its uh, nooks and uh, creases uh, m- more than I knew the nooks and creases of my uh, uh, ink worn journal or whatever. You know. There you <laughs> go. You got there. Uh, <laughs> I think that works. Okay. Um. Good job. Um. So yeah, this is this is a good way of of sort of tying into what we're always talking about in terms of point of view and how the description that you're using, we of course want the visuals to know the scene that we're describing, but the person that is doing the describing often colors the specifics of that cin- that sort of narrative cinematography that we're doing with our word choice, right? Because we might imagine that if we're filtering it through that character, then that character, how they see the scene is sort of how we want the audience to see the scene. Um, and uh, yeah, we can always to change the words and or change the point of view to vastly differentiate you know how your different pov chapters sound and feel and the complexity of words that you're using and the types of words that you're using the sorts of similes and metaphors that you use as well like each character is going to have a different frame of reference and uh unless you're writing an omniscient then you have um to kind of keep that frame of reference in mind but even even on an omniscient narrator it has its own sort of character to it uh, anything else you want to say about this one? Uh, not really. I, I just really like the painting. Uh, the exercise is uh, interesting. I love tone, and I love trying to do, like, convey, uh, I don't know, meaning through, like, word choice, I guess. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, thanks for hosting. It's been enjoyable. Great. Thanks, Luke. Looks like Dakota wrote us a little description. I'm actually going to invite Dakota up to read it out before I do the next volunteer. All right, here we go. <clears throat> so you mentioned Dickens. So I'm like, all right, Bleak House vibes. Let's go. <laughs> do it. Fog along River Thames boasted gladly with malice as the sleeping, somber serenity of the neighborhood of workhouses and spinsters lay without knowledge of the impending coronation of dread as Miss Elizabeth Harris walked along its empty cobblestone toward the death of her integrity. Wow. All right. Thank you for that. This is uh, using the kind of florid, old-fashioned prose here, especially when we dip into the alliteration the sleeping somber serenity all these things thank you for that Dakota um let's check our raised hands we have a raised hand from Michelle and from I can't quite read that name uh Akira I think I think Michelle was first hey how are you doing hi Michelle doing good you ready to pick a painting Oh, can I see the other ones? Um, yeah. I mean, I do love... Okay, let's so, see. So, one second. Wait, 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 I'll show you the ones we've done so far. We we started with oh, this okay. one as the very first example. We had okay. um, this... Dakota analyzed this one. Um, Megan mm-hmm. analyzed this one. Luke gave us this one. So, the remaining mm-hmm. paintings are... We have this sort of winter firelight kind of scene. Uh-huh, and... And then we have this telescope like by, the, by the window. Okay. Let's start um, with this one okay. then, and we'll start just by okay. looking for about 30 seconds. Okay. Um, 
I can't really see with what's. Uh, let me let me make this. Well, okay, there's a walking cane and some hiking, or not hiking, but some water boots. Okay, this looks like this would be my place. I <laughs> don't have a telescope. Um, cool. Okay. Let's, let's uh, yeah, let's look and just analyze in silence for a little while, and we'll come back with questions. Okay. okay. Okay, Michelle, first impressions? Well, I really like it. It's very homey. Um, looks like it's on Puget Sound, and I used to live on Puget Sound. Um, never had a telescope, but I've wanted one for a long time. And um, the the water, I call them water boots, but they're, you know, kind of like, like um, shoe galoshes. Very common up there. And the Native American um, print, Rug. Um, I don't know what tribe that would be from, but it would be it would fit the Pacific Northwest. Um, I love the lamp. I have the lamp kind of like that, um, and I have tables like that with magazines underneath. Um, and yeah, um, I had a walking stick. I've still got some walking sticks. Um, I like the chair. It's, it's early American, and that's kind of furniture I grew up with. So this feels a lot like home for me. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, but there's a glass that looks like whiskey, and I, I, I can't stand whiskey. <laughs> okay. So, so um, or maybe it's rum. I, I like rum, but I can't stand whiskey. Um, oh. you know. So, uh, um, question, questions right off the bat. So, um, you said this feels like home, right? This feels homey. This feels, um, mm -hmm. it has like a comforting quality to it, which is interesting yeah. to me because we were just looking at a very lonely, cold painting that had a person mm -hmm. in it. There's a person in there doing something. Um, mm -hmm. there's, there's no faces, there's no emotion here, but there's no people or emotions in this one either. But why does one feel comforting and one feels cold? Why does one feel like home? Mm -hmm. It's the warm colors. Um, mm -hmm. and the, um, the, the, um, I think the, the, some of the, um, not, some of the darker colors are a little bit in the foreground and some are in the, uh, in the, I mean, some are in the, yeah, foreground, but, but. But act like background is somewhere in the background and act like foreground with the lamp and it's warm light and I have lamps like that um, and then yet the the telescope is near there it's it's in the middle of um, it's it's almost on the center but not quite so we're what what this indicates is while this is homey there's something a little bit askew here mm -hmm. um, I imagine myself living here um, and um, you know when I'm not well, I'm not busy doing anything else, and you know maybe my boyfriend's um, off doing his re gr grading or something. You know I sit at my telescope, and you know when the when the clouds um, pass by, which is not often, and um, and the uh, on Puget Sound, I watch the stars um, and and planets, and maybe I watch the clouds and. You know, look look up the different clouds because I've forgotten all my all my cloud formations because I I did take earth science and astronomy and meteorology and in college just because they're interesting. Um, mm -hmm. So I might be watching the cloud formations and coming you know to tell my boyfriend every thirty minutes, hey this the cumulus clouds are passing so we don't have to worry about a bunch of rain tonight. You know, mm -hmm. and you know, we'll go walk the dogs and the cat the cats because we we go walk the cats they follow us so. You know, we might be able to go for our twilight, you know, walk, like you know, like always. Um, so I might do that. Just that, and that would be interesting to me. You know, that's um, so. Yeah. Um, let's see. And there's the walking stick and the shoe galoshes, and I'd I'd wear those, and I'd wear um, probably the red plaid jacket, and um, and with the raincoat, and um, 
I don't know why I would have poured um, a glass of rum because I wouldn't have done that. Maybe it's a cu- maybe it's a cup of, of cold coffee. I'd, I'd have that instead. Sure, and totally the, up to you. And the painting, there's a big rock there. Um, I don't paint, but my sister does. And I might have sent her a photo and said, could you could you paint this for me? And um, she would have done it and just sent it to me. And I, I love her art. Um, so... And then there's a stack of magazines that, you know, I'd read. I, I'd read those and just keep them. They might be, they'd probably be National Geographics that are 20 years old, and I'd just reread them. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, and maybe political magazines, because we like those too. Um, so, yeah, and this would be our little house, uh, maybe three or four bedroom house. And this is what houses look like in the Pacific Northwest. They had this kind of um, boarding um, on the walls. And um, they don't have those kind of windows. Those are more modern, but that'd be okay. Um, and there's some nice deciduous trees that'll um, change colors. And, um, and I'm right there on the water. We have a little... Maybe a little dinghy, maybe a, maybe a, a canoe, or maybe some some um, kayaks, and we just go, we you know we go kayaking or, or paddling, you know, like during the evening or the day or you know, so it'd be really nice. Um, we, don't, so, <laughs> we don't have to buy, we don't have to put in a swimming pool. We can just go swim in the in the sound. <laughs> yeah, comes with its own swimming pool, doesn't it? Right, exactly. So he'd be, he'd say, well, you, you, you always say you want a house with a swimming pool. We're right here on the beach. We don't have to have a swimming pool. You know, like, that's right. We don't need to have a swimming pool. So, okay, you, I'm sorry, you wanted to ask yeah. a question. question. Questions, yeah. So let's, um, I think, well, so first I just wanted to note that I think something that also makes it feel very sort of lived in, as opposed to the earlier one that we saw, which feels very cold and almost yeah. like a place where you don't want to be, because this is, mm-hmm. to, to begin with, this is a street and an alley that feels almost a little disconcerting. Whereas this feels mm-hmm. safe, I would say. Mm-hmm. Part, of, part of that yeah. is also the fact that it feels so lived in, or the thing that makes it feel very lived in is the details like the coats on the wall. Like there's two separate coats there, indicating that two mm-hmm. people perhaps live here together. The, the half-poured drink with some missing from the glass. We have the dog-eared, crinkled magazines, which implies to that mm-hmm. they've been read many times. Like it just feels like a place where people have lived or do or do, mm-hmm. do live there currently um mm-hmm. let's ask how would we give it a different tone or mood what if we wanted this not to be so sort of you know uh uh safe and comforting but in fact you wanted this to be a very scary place well okay the clouds are you know they're very overcast in the pacific northwest especially around the sound that is normal um and um, it's very cold um, in the winter time, but yet it rarely snows. And the type of cold you have is just oh, it's it's just feels like it goes right down to your bones. So, um, you know, there's lots of orcas, and let's let's change this. Maybe there's something like the Loch Ness monster, you know, in the Sound, and um, no one's ever seen it. It's been living in the deep, and for whatever reason, it's decided to come into the Sound, and it um, and it appears. Um, right there, um, near the uh, near the person's house. I'm I'm just gonna make this my house. It okay. looks very, I like this, you know. Um, although I might have a little bit more comfortable chair. Um, yeah, that, that's that like a, do- like a dinner a, chair. Yeah, that you know, I might I might just put a pad on it, you know, because mm-hmm. the back is fine. It just my butt might get sore. So you know, I've been looking um, at things through my telescope, and it looks like you know. Um, a um a big kind of sea monster has appeared right almost like right right at the shore right by my house and i'm thinking uh let's see i've seen this and i'm gonna wait to see if you know i'm gonna put my camera connect it to my telescope and get pictures of it you know and i i wait for weeks and weeks and it doesn't appear but then you know there's been a couple kids missing and they turn up on you know on my shore and they have giant okay, this, bike this is like a whole story now this is so we're, we're just talking about the single image but but yes oh, I, okay. I i definitely agree that painting a sea monster into it would make it much scarier yeah. for sure oh um, sorry I thought, I thought i was supposed to go into all that detail i apologize that's okay that that's just like outside of the scope of just just the picture so let's focus on just the image um so okay. so we can see how it's portrayed here in this very comforting way we might imagine 
if it were painted differently it could create a different mood let's just go back to the painting as it is though let's think how we would describe it so what's the first thing that your eye kind of goes to maybe we can use that as the first the subject of the first sentence i would say the water because the water is pretty much in the middle even though the telescope is a little bit off center but you know i'd say those are really the focus the the water and the telescope because um someone either looks at the the sky the water the trees they're looking for something so I'd say the water and the telescope. Um, and they're there for a while because there's, there's this drink that's, ha you know, it's been half drunk. Um, or um, And, um, you know, so they've been sitting there for a while. So I'd say the water and the telescope are the focus. And okay. this could, in, in, in the Pacific Northwest, this could be the morning. It could be, the, it could be, you know, 12, you know, noon. Or it could be four or five it's just so cloudy there all the time it's hard to tell um right. so but there is a storm coming and there's this little black thing in the water and that could be that could be an orca true you know could be a lockdown so we don't know <laughs> could be, could, yeah could be could be the puget sound monster mm -hmm. um well um anyway um or maybe the loch ness monster jumped over the you know the land you know, the, the, the land somehow or went under and it's now appeared there anyway. But, um, yeah, I'd say those are the focus. And, um, well, since the lamp is on, you know, this, um, it needs to provide some more light because there's, there's not really an, enough light to be able to observe what's going on there very well. Okay. So yeah, maybe we could include the lamp in the, of the, in the first sentence description of the room as well. If you're starting yeah. with the water, and you sort, you sort of we're asking what's the focal point, you sort of mentioned two things, but we could maybe connect them. You mentioned the telescope and the water. You might start mm -hmm. the description of the scene, like, I could see the entirety of the bay from my window with my telescope. Something like mm -hmm. that, right? That's sort of, you are saying the character is perceiving or looking out through the telescope to see this scene. And then maybe mm -hmm. as we continue to add detail, that's when you would sort of expand on the room around them. Yeah, and, you know, but it, but, um, but the Pacific Northwest tended to be cloudy um, throughout the day and the night, and my lamplight and, and and the lamplight in my room um, provided additional illumination. That's beginning to sound a little bit purple, but you know, um, but That's okay. you know, yeah, that, that way we could we could um, we could include the the light um, right there, mm -hmm. and it's in the corner, so it provides lamplight to um, a lot of that area and yet it comes out you know towards towards the middle of of that that area yep so as we continue to add more detail if you wanted to make it purple you could go on and on about the you know the the dark umber of the lamplight as it splays <laughs> on the magazines and like all these things um, and you could just go into something about light and reflections just really draws the purple prose out of people i don't know exactly why they always harp on those things but um, but light's important, yeah. you know. It is important. Is, that, that is true. And know? it does a lot of different stuff. Like, right. it can mm -hmm. be envisioned and, and described in many ways. Anyway, and um, um, go ahead. Well, and it looks kind of like maybe the window is open because on the other side, it looks more like you're, um, it looks more like you're looking through glass. And um, we, th these type of windows, when they open, um, they can, um, they can go all the way up to where those little windows at the top, that's, you know, that's where the bottom of the window is, and you, it's hard to tell unless you're right there, or they might, um, they might be, um, split in the middle and open, you know, all the way on the other side, so, um, it looks to me like, um, that person is, um, looking out, um, and the window is open, and it's just, but you wouldn't be able to see it unless you were right there, yeah. um, that just looks that way to me and um so and maybe you know it's chilly even though it might be it might be june but it's chilly you know it's still like 60 something degrees and um so but, and the coats you know they're right there so you could put your coat on yeah these are all things the character in the scene would be able to feel and experience and describe in uh as, as we talk about the room, you know, always the temperature, the bite of the wind, whatever it is, would inform our description, mm -hmm. too. Thank you for this. Let's wrap up with this one. So we only have 20 minutes left, so yeah. we do have to move um, to our last couple. 
Um, thank you so much for all these thoughts, Michelle. All right, we have um, just a short amount of time left. Um, I did see Akira, I believe, first. Hey. Hi there. I would like for you to go back um, to the painting of like uh, the snow. Uh, yeah, this that one? one. All right. Yeah, that's this one. Okay, so we're supposed to like get a few minutes to like uh, come up with a description, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Let's just uh, we'll just take a look and see what you notice for about thirty seconds. I'm ready. All right. First impressions. What this tells me is um, can have a tale like um, a quiet, uh, sad, uh, but also like beautiful like story that has like the uh, appeal of like it being the twilight of someone's years, metaphorically, with how it's all cold, mostly dark, with some light across it. Great, thanks for that. So, um, yeah, we might imagine how this a scene like this might be used in a story, or the tone of the atmosphere of this might kind of give the vibe of a certain kind of narrative unfolding. We might get certain ideas about a character that might fit into this world or, or something like that. Let's ask, where does your eye go first, and what do you? What are some details that you notice like about what draws your attention? Well, first it was uh, the light uh, from the open like uh, garage thing there, where mm -hmm. like the light just like illuminates. But I started to notice that if you look up, up uh, in the top, you can see a small little uh, cabin with a small light in there. Mm -hmm. And again, like it could be like a good metaphorical like story for someone who's at the twilight, the twilight of their years. That like sure. there's only a few amount of life back, so it could have like this story of like someone who is like making like his or her magnum opus in that garage thing. And. Uh, as the light sl slowly starts to fade away inside because it's mostly lighting up by a candle that could be metaphorically that as he or her has finished their ultimate craft they can finally rest in peace and go to another stage of their afterlife makes sense i like that so to that and i think that ties into how we kind of envision warm and cold or light and dark a lot of the time which is that the warm and bright colors represent life and happiness and we might imagine the blues the darks the, the you know the black uh the gray all these things might often represent kind of either sadness unhappiness or death in this case it makes sense because you know if you're outside in the winter you will freeze or be cold and when you're inside it's warm and so it just makes sense that it would that we would think about it that way but you could see this as do you do you see this emotion that it's evoking as sort of more hopeful or is this more melancholy what it tells me is that uh, someone is um, could finally like is finally like doing like their best most uh, ever, but um, it could also have like this sad feeling to it. But I'm someone who sees like the beauty in all like the four seasons, mm -hmm. so even if it's supposed to look like very depressed, it still has its beauty to it. And good, good point. So I think when you're looking at it like this, it can have its views uh, like this here like uh, there's different ways you can look at death it could be a bad or a good thing like mm -hmm. uh, if you've lost everyone and you're the oldest one in, and you everyone you knew is like gone when you finally been able to like finish your thing and you can finally like move on you can finally meet the people that you lost right kind of adds a you to think of it in those terms adds a sort of eulogistic or almost like a requiem style tone to a scene like this especially when you start connecting the metaphor of you know the light of the hearth or the light of the lamp or whatever it is the light of the house to that person's sort of remaining vitality or artistic expression or their sort of it sort of comes to represent their soul you could quite easily mm. in, a, in a book it becomes quite easy to connect ideas like that you know you know i actually one time saw like a similar thing 
that's done a little bit thing like here. So what they did in this shot here was that it was supposed to be like the end. Uh, I'm paraphrasing a lot here, but it was supposed to be in the middle of the night. And uh, as we like pan showed like the last shot of like a city and something like this here, when the lights are street lamps like shut off, that's when the movie like cuts to black. And that's to indicate that we're done here. Good night. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, so it gets to be like something like this. For sure. And if we were there's to... a lot of okay. there's a lot of ways you can, you can also just like do it like uh, you just like cuts to black. But if you want to like add like a cool like effect, you can have it tie into like the shot. For example, there was a documentary also I saw one time of uh, a family fighting for the custody of their child, and the last scene they show is like them eating pizza, and the shot shows the little baby like closing the pizza box, and then the narration says. And this place is closed now, and then it just closes, like the whole shot and all that. Yeah, that's a nice bookend uh, to cap cap off the story at the end. Um, so let's think in terms of how we would describe the scene in different levels of detail. So in just one sort of sentence, it doesn't have to be perfect. You can stumble through it or make mistakes or or change your mind or anything like that. But maybe you could think of one sentence just to describe what we're seeing here. The twilight of the day. Okay, that might yeah, that, that might even be the the title or something like that. If we were to sort of say this is generally what the scene will be about, um, maybe add, maybe let's add a little more. So think of like a complete sentence with a subject and a verb and and everything else. Man is at the twilight of his years. He uh, is about to finish his magnum opus, final piece, in the cold winter of December. Just as he's about to finish it, his life force gives up, and so the light in his uh, garage shuts off, like, uh, dies along with him. Nice. Well, that was like the whole story. <laughs> that was that was a series of events. Um, so yeah, if we were to continue to add more and to, to move through the story, we might go, not just is this a, you know, if we're, if we're just describing the moment, just the image, just the painting, we might talk about, for instance, you started with the twilight, right? So you maybe, you, if you want to make the night or the passing of the day the sort of main subject, you might say something like, you know, twilight descended on a small snowy village, something like that, where it's, we're, we're talking mostly about the the passing of time, the changing in quality of light and things like that. Um, if you were to add more to the narrative, you might go into the character and like how this, whatever's going on connects to his project or his, the diminishing of his life or anything like that. How would we add even more? What would be like a ridiculous amount of detail or a thing to focus on or a really tortured way we could, you know, overwrite the scene. Well, we could um, try to do something like that uh, in the garage. There's like a photo of him with his family when he was younger, and uh, to um, give like such a like an explanation that like they're all they're all like gone. Like he's the last one here. We could even like to make it a little bit more sad. Have like a small toy he made out of woods for his son when he was when he was little and has his name on it and to have it like it stay on the shelf to indicate that this is something he made from a long time ago that's passed but he doesn't have the strength to fully like uh, leave it behind okay yeah maybe we could even if if we're taking it to an extreme maybe we could even say that the paragraph would go on to describe everything on his shelves right every little memento, every tiny pen cap and paper clip, and the paper clip that once held together his, you know, book report from school in eighth grade, and, like, you go into just so much on all his little possessions, then that might kind of well, be just taking a little too far. Well, go ahead. Now, I am not a, a senior person, but I've known senior persons in my life, and one thing I've noticed is that when it comes to stories about them, it's like they always like to, like, go into detail about every little thing they have. That we may not so like we may just see his paper clip but to him it could be something important because he's reminded of that day when he went to high school sure. or he could see like this bum in the in the wall and he's reminded of that time when he got so angry that he punched in the wall and gave a little bit of a dent so even if it just seems like useless oh no i've lost weight but how did i do it it's all thanks i think to we're this hearing some kind of tv very somebody's <laughs> mic let me just move her from the room sorry about that so even if it's so in most stories it would just be like clutter and clutter and clutter 
feeling that to feel of a page but because into the context of like a man's like the last few minutes we always like remember everything about ourselves even the small things that we took for granted yeah, so in this thing like so in this thing like if you were to like come up with a story like this to me in a page thing here as a pitch, pitch or something I would look past the fact that it just like fill the page with every small little detail in this context here because it does make sense and add up here if it was sure. like a teenage uh, drama story I would just tell you to um, get out of my office for wasting right. my time yeah <laughs> Or if it's a creature feature, we're wondering about the werewolf, but you're going into detail on the thumbtacks on the guy's wall for ten pages, then we, it might kill the pace of the book. Yeah. But good thoughts. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm, I'm glad you, you liked it. We have time for just one more. I thought... Was Eden's hand up? No. Not anymore? Okay. Maybe we can wrap up then with final thoughts and questions on anything we talked about today. Again, I'm not an artist. I'm, I did not have a a background in fine art which is why I'm actually trying to challenge myself to think of these things more and to actually pay attention to the specific ways that we can create tone and mood and atmosphere and how to balance the level of detail that we use in our prose. Any last thoughts that anybody wants to share you can raise a hand and speak out loud we have just five six minutes left but if you have quick questions or comments then we're glad to hear them. Mario go ahead. You might have to click the accept invitation. Or maybe he left the room. I'm not sure. Okay, we'll reopen the room or reopen the floor. Questions, comments, last thoughts? Anyone that knows more about art than me wanna tell me how I've completely misinterpreted all these paintings and they're all about, you know, something a completely different theme that we missed. Um, Luke, do you want to read your description that you just wrote for the scene? Or anyone else want to read any of their prose that they wrote today? Feel free to raise a hand. Um, not really. Uh, I'll read it, yeah. So as far as the art critiques, I think uh, uh, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Mm -hmm. My my advice is just... Um, I don't know. I, I really try not to read too deep into the meaning that artists try to inject into their work because a lot of artists don't inject much meaning into their work, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, it does. It, they don't have to think about it that much for it to be good art, I would say, which is why I'm, I'm here mostly focusing on like the feeling and, and the atmosphere rather than like specifically what they're right. trying to say. Or like, I don't know if paintings have dramatic arguments in the same way, do they? I guess they're some not dramatic. So I think they, I think the really... last houses might have some kind of dramatic argument. Maybe, um, but I guess it's not drama, so it can't be dramatic. It's just a visual argument, right, or something. Right, but I'm a lot sure. of people come up to me and tell me my art like means this and that, and I just kind of smile and nod, and you know. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, so. Oh, I've got to read my description. Yeah, go ahead. An orange wedge of light shot from the open carriage house door and splashed across the snow-strewn street, falling on the entrance of the adjacent domicile, a two-story brick and oak home, 1619 Plibleton Lane. I think it's a little bit purple. I mean, quite a lot bit purple, honestly. Uh, Not too bad. But I, that was that was the point. But you start, so yeah, your subject was the wedge of light. So that's an interesting yeah. way, to, way to start. I always like also when uh, light does unusual things in, or, or not unusual things in prose, but it can slice or cut or things like that. Like yeah. a knife slash of light hacks out into the evening. Things like the, the way that you can describe light moving it or acting in ways that are, uh, yeah. I don't, I don't quite know how, I don't have the words to describe the visuals very well. <laughs> But, um, I, I, but yeah, I like I the idea of starting very, with that as a subject works well. Go ahead. Uh, I remember sort of like very vivid descriptions of spotlights in some book I read as a kid doing all of those things, cutting and slicing and, uh, I don't know, all of the verbs that a light might do. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thank you for that, Luke. Um, Mario, do you have questions, comments, thoughts? Your mic is muted, by the way, so you'll have to click the microphone icon to speak loud. Yeah, so part of my problem with the purple prose is that it's unearned, right? Because mm -hmm. like, why is the POV 
paying attention to the surroundings. So it works better with like dirt omniscient because omniscient can go anywhere, mm -hmm. right? And so that's that's like a trick of it. But then I still like it, it has to be like sort of drawn to the plot. And sometimes I see like what most genre writers do because I'm a genre like fantasy writer. It's always sunlight, right? It's always yep. light that hits something that hits something else that hits something else. It's basically like a writer would just use the, the light coming from the light, right? Yep. And it starts starts hitting every branch. It's like throwing a ball, like a, a pachinko ball, and then it'll hit every branch downwards. Mm -hmm. And so you like in this in this painting right here, right? It would it would it would be it would be like the light the um, the light hits the snow, and then it will hit the snow, and then you it's it, and then you get the icicles like fingers crawling down like the demon's nail, mm -hmm. and uh, leading my lead, leading toward the hell hole. But I know it's not a hellhole. It's only a red uh, lantern light, and it goes into, uh, but the light is blah 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 blah. Your mom and your sister died of cancer, or something, and then it's, you know stuff like that. Stuff like that. Yeah, good point. So okay. you're sort of saying that the point of view has to, uh, if you're writing in a purple way, it has to be a character that would think that way, or that would at least perceive that way, right? Yeah, you have to hang a lantern on it somehow. It has to be earned, right? In some so, way. You so know, if like, your character like is. It, a stalker, then you might give a really purple description of the person. Yeah, stalking. or if, if 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 they're like if they're alone, or if they're drunk, or if they're in a car ride, it's usually something like they're sitting still and they're really bored and they're like dozing off or something. Right. Something that makes their pen, something that earns their pensiveness. It's like if they're like if you're playing ping pong, right? Mm -hmm. Right after ping pong, is they're not gonna like sit down and like look at the shelves, you know? Right, right. Or imagine yeah. if they're trapped in a room for a year then you might have a scene where we want a really, really, really purple description of that room because that would sort of mirror the character's experience. Yeah, he's going to be like, oh, after he tries to escape, he's going to, like, oh, fuck. There's nothing else to do but to examine the room. Yeah, exactly. So someone in prison, someone in the hospital, you could easily see them giving a purple yeah. description of the room. I like that in. better. I like those those purple, those purple entryways to purple pose a little yeah. bit better. That, yeah, that's, a, that's a good point, the way we can use it on purpose for a specific narrative effect. Thank you for that. Um, we are at our time, but we have time for maybe one more question or thought or comment, if anybody wants to wrap up. Let's see, Dakota says, I almost exclusively write purple prose, but I'm writing in a specific time and place in third omniscient. The most modern I've gone in is 1900. Okay, so you're sort of deliberately antiquating it on, um, uh, for narrative effect. That makes sense. And Luke has a Beksinski quote for us. Let's just end with that for today, Luke. What do you say? Why don't you read that out? Uh, how do you say his first better. name? Do you know how to read it? Uh, it's like Zizhlov or Zizhlov? something like that. Okay. Um, I love his paintings, though. He's painted some insane, like, Lovecraftian hellscapes and things. Yeah, he has... There's another quote, too. Let me see if I can find it. Um, yeah, meaning is meaningless to me. I do not care for symbolism, and I paint what I paint without meditating on a story. Uh, and then another one where it, it misses the point to ask me what, what scenes in, in my paintings mean. Simply, I do not know myself. More, moreover, I am not at all interested in knowing. So that's fun. Don't know, don't care, don't bother me <laughs> with what you <laughs> no, think don't it care, means. Leave me alone, basically. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well, that's a fine way to approach it. I mean, you don't need a reason to to paint any p portrait, just like you don't really need a reason to tell any story. Um, I think that when you're doing things like, obviously, trying to make a movie that costs millions of dollars that, and have a lot of people, other people involved, it behooves you to have a better reason why, or like a clearer rationale for why you've made that thing. But if it's something as personal as fi fine art that you've made on your own, then like to some people it defeats the point almost entirely. It's like, this is how I think. This is just thinking. Why would you ask what why I had a thought, right? Like, it's because I did, is the answer. True, especially in surrealism, which was his uh, genre, I guess. Um, right. You know, he's painting, he, he, he described his paintings as like photographs of dreams, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and I wish I had dreams like that. I would, uh, or, well, maybe I don't. That would be horrifying. But I kind of do, because... I want to see all the cool. Oh, I have I have dreams stuff. way weirder. If you if I could <laughs> capture the stuff that's in my brain, like I we're, we're working I would on be AI that can a do that. Gazillionaire. Well, we're working on I'm AI be that a gazillionaire. I guess you are. I hope you remember us when uh, you get one of those helmets that you put on your head that sort of translates yeah, your dreams into right. AI interpreted images. 
when I get to pilot Cerebro, like Art Cerebro. You just can't wait to have Cerebro and just be able to like Google people all over the world or whatever it is that he does. He like invades their brains. I don't know what I, what I would do. I would just use it to make art, I guess. So. Well, that, that's probably the best possible thing you could use it for. Um, you just have to defend it from, you know, Magneto. Um, You're giving me an idea for a <laughs> screenplay now. Oh, well, there you go. Free free ideas. Come to WordCamp classes. You'll get free ideas for your stories. we got to wrap up for now. We're past our time. But thank you guys for coming to this new kind of experimental class, just trying stuff out, trying to expand our horizons and think about tone, atmosphere, and other prose topics in a different way by like looking at them through a different lens or by connecting them to a different medium that has uh, something in common with what we're trying to do, which is ultimately create pictures in one form or another. But in, by looking at it at a different medium, I think it helps us re-examine how we approach it in our own. Um, thank you guys so much. And again, anybody who knows more than art, feel free in the comments to tell me of the many things that I did not have the vocabulary to understand. And I'm glad to learn more about that. Um, let's wrap up. And we have, since today's Saturday, if you're an unlimited member, we have lab today at 4 to 6. So bring whatever questions and topics you have. And up, up to five pages of your work for critique. It's another great reason to sign up is that you can come to lab every week and bring up to five pages and get lots of feedback and detailed answer, answers to your questions and things like that. And then tomorrow we have uh, table reads 2 p.m. Hope to see you guys soon at your next Script Camp event. Thanks for coming by. Thanks.